Mordheim, City of the Damned. It occurred to me that despite making several series of the video game of the same name way, way back in the day, I never actually did a video on the city, its history, and how it was eventually destroyed. Mostly. Kinda. Sort of. Anyways. And I reckon it is high time to rectify that mistake. Incidentally, the video game, literally Mordheim, the City of the Damned, is still available on Steam for about $20 or so, I think. I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it today, as it has not aged all that well, to be fair. But on the flip side, if you are a fan of Mordheim or interested in playing it, your options are limited, as this was one of Games Workshop's little sidestep experimental games released in... Oh god, um, this is pre-2000s shit, 1998, 9, 7, something like that, and support for Mordheim was more or less officially dropped just a few years later. In all due likelihood, this was as a result of poor sales and the fact that Games Workshop's intent with Mordheim to create a smaller scale and faster skirmishing style variant of Warhammer didn't really succeed per se, as whilst Mordheim is certainly a lot smaller than Warhammer, your average game will still take you half an hour, 40 minutes at least, and maybe as long as a couple of hours. These days, I believe pretty much any and all mention of Mordheim have long since been scrubbed from all official Games Workshop websites and platforms, which of course has the negative meaning of no further support, <laughs> but then again, DW has always been dodgy when it came to that anyways, and it comes with the benefit of allowing the still fairly active and passionate fan community to do anything they want with the setting, because GW has no further use for it. But enough of ancient history, let us instead turn our eyes towards fictional ancient history, as the city that was eventually to become Mordheim did not start out as a city at all, nor even as a colony or a trade post or anything of the sort. A thousand years into the Imperial Calendar, the Raven Order of Knights set up a single fortress monastery, little more than a fortified tower really, on the border towards Stirlin and in the Elector County of Ostermark. Unfortunately, we have very little reliable information about this mysterious order of knights, their deeds and purpose long since lost to the mists of time. What we do know is that the fortress monastery was erected specifically in the honour of Count Gotthard Angelos, the order's recently killed master. We do not know who killed him, or why, or why this spot in particular was chosen for the settlement. We could speculate, perhaps, the name, the Raven Order, indicates a link to the Cult of Moor, the god of the dead, whose symbol is of course a raven. Now this doesn't give us any better idea of what he died fighting, though judging by the timeline, year 1000 in the Imperial Calendar, we're still a good thousand years before the arrival of Vlad von Karstein, so it is unlikely that he died fighting the undead, which would be the natural enemies of Moor. It'd be far more likely that he fell victim to Greenskins, perhaps, a rampaging orc warband, as there were still plenty of greenskins infesting the countless woodland depths of the Empire, not to mention the occasional orc incursion from across the world's edge mountains as well. A second natural adversary might be Chaos Warbands, Cultists or Raiders. Ostermark is one of the northernmost provinces in the Empire, and whilst Mordheim is on the southernmost border of Ostermark, Chaos 
does not really recognize borders, really. And cultists tend to seek out the deep dark of the forest, just like greenskins do. And so either one would be a likely adversary for the Grand Master of a knightly order of the time. As for why there, well, perhaps it was where he was killed. That would be a natural enough reason. Perhaps it was a spot of special importance to the order, equally likely. Or maybe it was chosen simply because of its strategic position on the River Stir, leading into, of course, the River Reich, which commands much of the trade throughout the Empire. Therefore, if the question is where to found a city, well, Mordheim is in a pretty good spot. And indeed, the reason why it would eventually grow into a city was precisely because of trade. Now, whether or not that was the intent of the Raven Order, again, it is impossible to tell. But clearly, traders passing by, selling various goods deeper within the Empire, thought that staying the night at a fortified citadel guarded by a knightly order seemed like a pretty damn good idea in this lawless land of theirs. And so clearly, an industry sprang up to support them. Initially, I would imagine that the Knightly Order granted hospitality to travellers either as a part of their creed, now granted the worshippers of Moor are not necessarily the friendliest lot around, but a couple of donations here and there to cover food and lodging might help their hospitality. And so the rumour grew. One merchant told the other that if he was looking for a safe place to stay the night when travelling the River Stir, well, a fortified tower guarded by knights once more is a pretty damn good spot. One merchant led to two, two merchants led to three, three to four, and so on, and so on, and so on. Until the Raven Order were probably inundated with guests all the time. And if they were indeed of the Cult of Moor, they'd probably be a rather morose lot. Not too interested in the company of jovial merchant, more interested in getting shit-faced drunk on their one night of safety rather than listening to their preachings, and so maybe a bit of space was required. A palisade erected outside of the fortified tower, where a inn could be built, or perhaps a tavern to keep the merchants and their jubilations out from underneath the holy feet of the night. Maybe a stable would need to be erected to take care of their horses. Maybe they started bringing along wagon loads of goods. Well, okay, that needs to be stored somewhere as well. And so a warehouse popped up. Once that happened, the merchants figured, okay, well, this might as well be a way station now, and further warehouses popped up. And now that this had become a temporary storage yard for goods and wares travelling up and down the river, they needed guards, they needed people to maintain the houses, they needed perhaps some trained firemen in case of a blaze, they needed the people to build the warehouses in the first place, they needed lumberjacks to cut down wood, they needed timberers and carpenters to shape it and hammer it all together. And of course, in turn, the carpenters required a blacksmith to produce nails. Otherwise, all they could construct were ramshackable buildings as temporary as the cargo. Once the warehouses were built, they were also going to need boxes and barrels to store things in. The growing community would need food, necessitating hunters and farmers. The society would need all of the various diddly doodads of a civilized village. They would need pots and pans, they would need rope, they might need a medicine woman, etc, 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 etc. And all of these various necessities, of course, came with their own families, children, wives, yadi yadi yadi. It's not difficult to imagine how a humble trading post might grow rather rapidly into something altogether larger. <laughs> it has happened plentiful times throughout our own human history, after all. 
And so, a single solitary tower turned into a village. A village turned into a town, a town into a city, and a city eventually into a capital. Over the course of some 700 plus years, mind you, it took a while, but Mordheim would eventually be the capital of Ostermark. It seemed uh, quite the blessed little city, in fact, as it grew fat and rich on commerce, attracting a considerable population well in excess of a hundred thousand people. A lot for a medieval-slash-early-renaissance-style city, and grew quite influential as well as can be seen by its status as capital. Furthermore, it was one of uh, relatively few made cities to escape the ravages of Gorbad Ironclaw in the imperial calendar year of 1700 or so. Uh, Gorbad was, well, an unfortunate happenstance in the history of the Empire. Having come ravaging across the world's edge mountains, he launched perhaps the single most devastating warg in Orcish history, burning and destroying several major imperial cities, including Newland, and laying near complete waste to the province of Solon. And the only thing that spared Mordheim a similar fate was a good old-fashioned dumb luck. Mordheim had dispatched a sizable portion of its own army, its own citizen militia, to fight alongside the defenders of the Empire in one of the opening battles of the War of Gorbad Ironclaw's invasion. The Mordheim soldiers, along with most of the rest of the Imperial Army, were slaughtered, and the city left virtually defenseless in Gorbad's path. But, for reasons only known to the Greenskin Warlord himself, he chose instead to turn south, heading in the direction of Avalon. Gorbad Ironclaws' rampages were considerable, to put it mildly, but they might be the subject of another video. For now, all you need know is that Mordheim was miraculously spared complete annihilation, or at the very least absolute devastation, at the hands of the Orky Borkies. And since Mordheim was far luckier than many Imperial cities, this left it in a beautiful position to help pick up the pieces, and its import, value, and influence as a trade city only grew thereafter, until the city was about to celebrate 1,000 years of near uninterrupted prosperity, with an extra sign, an extra event on the way as well. A twin-tailed comet had been spotted in the sky above the Empire. Now, the twin-tailed comet, of course, is the symbol of Sigma, and countless preachers all across the Empire announced that this was the return of Sigma himself. Finally, the Empire would be rid of all of its weakness, all of its threats, and reunited once more after some rather turbulent past years, including a couple of civil wars here and there, under the unflinching leadership of their god, Sigma Heldenhammer. Others interpreted the comet uh, somewhat differently, but by and large they were ignored as pessimists and naysayers. And the populace of Mordheim were more excited than nearly any other, for the comet could be seen clear and bright in the night sky above the city. Now, Mordheim was still an incredibly wealthy and influential trade hub. It was populated by, again, well, in excess of 100,000 people, many of which were amongst the richest in the entire empire. The city, one might even say, had grown to be a pinch, um... <laughs> <laughs> Corrupt would be the uh, the mean term. Uh, economically creative is the one I prefer. 
though it certainly cannot be denied that many of Mordheim's uppermost strata of citizenry had found more than one or two or even three ways of lining their own pockets, frequently at the expense of those lower than them on the social pecking order. Vile tongues might even wag in suggestion to say that Mordheim had become, um... A pinch rotten, perhaps, but never fear such malcontents were swiftly crushed by the private armies of the countless trading houses of Mordheim. <laughs> we can't have such a civil disobedience spreading and threatening the festivities on the year 1999 of the Imperial Calendar, especially not right before the New Year's celebrations. And speaking of the festivities, not only was this a grand party held in one of the largest cities of the Empire, but with the twin-tailed comet seemingly heading almost directly towards the city, people were thronging to get in the gates and take part in this great event again. Many expected this to be finally the return of their god Sigma. The fanatics alone must have numbered in the tens of thousands. And finally, the hour struck midnight, and God was about to descend. Unfortunately, however, the various prophets had clearly misread the celestial signs somewhat, as, well, something most assuredly did descend upon Mordheim that day, though it probably wasn't the comet. It was a rock, most assuredly, but one of a far more glowy supernatural origin, as a comet of solid warpstone impacted directly into the city of Mordheim, bringing a rather sudden and complete halt to the festivities. Now, the impact alone would have killed thousands upon thousands, but that was merely the hors d'oeuvre, as the nature of the meteor, of course, was the warping material of warp stone. And many fascinating things happened throughout the city. For example, the Steinhardt Memorial Gardens. These had been created by many of the more affluent members of Mordheim's upper most civil strata, who had imported various luxurious and majestic plants from all across the old world for people to gaze at in wonderment. The place had apparently become quite the popular dating spot for young lovers, and at the eve of the turning of the millennia, it was populated like never before. They would swiftly come to regret this decision, however, as the filthy, dirty normies that they were were suddenly set upon by the now very much so alive and very much so hungry plants of the garden. And to make sure that everybody else too could share in this miraculous event of life finding a way, the enormous oak specially imported from a faraway land decided that it was a good time to stretch its roots a little bit and began wandering down the promenade towards the western gatehouse, one of the primary ways to flee the city at the time, where it once again rerouted itself and slaughtered everyone trying to escape, eventually building its own little nest of skulls. And yet this honestly was amongst the lesser horrors of the city. At least you can avoid the garden and the tree. It'd be more difficult to avoid the hordes of demons streaming out of the enormous fires that were set by the impact in the great library of Mordheim. You see, this place had been filled with books of a dubious nature, many of which were not supposed to be there, but as usual, the rich and powerful tend to operate in a bit of a different set of rules to the common man. And so, many tomes on necromancy, demonology, summoning, and the dark arts were stored within its walls. When the fires reached them, they did not burn. Instead, they started doing what they had been created to do. 
and began opening manifold rifts into the immaterium through which its densians could stream. And Mordheim was a most inviting place for the demons on that particular evening of the year 2000. Lots of screaming, lots of fear, lots of bleeding humans running through the streets like stuck pigs. Fortunately, these horrors would eventually begin fading away as the tomes were slowly but surely devoured by the flames and their power weakened, whilst yet others persist, like Count Steinhardt's. The same name as the Memorial Gardens, you might remember. See, the Count was the last in a long list of prominent de facto rulers of the city. And he was as rich as he was fat. And he was rich enough to apparently pave the courtyard of his palace in solid gold. That should give you some idea as to his stature, both societally and physically speaking. He was in the midst of holding a massive New Year's ball at the aforementioned palace when the comet struck. As it was uh, unfortunately close to the warpstone fallout, the Count and all of his guests were transformed into hideous monstrosities. Most of the guests um, are no longer there, having disappeared inside of the Count, as he himself now squats in the center of his mansion. Or perhaps it is better yet to say that he has practically become his mansion now, as he dispatches his previous servants out into the streets of Mordheim to bring adventurers and unfortunate people, or whatever else they might come across, to him, to throw them into his enormous gullet, so that he may continue snacking even in the, uh, afterlife? <laughs> Close enough, anyways. And those are, of course, only the uh, supernatural dangers, a mere taste of the many supernatural dangers that now roam through the city, including the undead as well, incidentally, as well, mass deposits of warpstone tend to lead to uh, unquiet ancestors. Yet, the city has enjoyed brisk business even after its fall, as countless often hyperbolic rumours of the tremendous wealth still trapped within the city has spread throughout the empire, bringing adventurers and sellswords by the thousands flocking to it to seek their fortune. Yet others arrive for different purposes. The Skaven, for example, know very well what Warpstone is and they simply want all of it. Dwarves have arrived to try and reclaim parts of the once prominent Dwarven Quarter, where ancient heirlooms are rumoured to lie. Vampires, undead, and necromancers flock to it for forbidden knowledge. The forces of chaos arrive for kind of the same reason, but also because the pit, the impact spot where the comet landed, is rumoured to contain portals to the other world. And it's Densians who might be willing to whisper all kinds of interesting secrets into willing ears. And yet further humans arrive, having heard interesting rumours about miraculous shards of green rock called Weirdstone. Apparently, Weirdstone is a magical, mystical, do-it-all chemical and alchemical source. It can turn lead to gold, it can cure any disease, it can even regrow limbs and, uh... <laughs> Technically, theoretically, it can. It's just that it also has many other interesting uses. <laughs> as Weirdstone Stone is more commonly referred to as Warp Stone. Now, to be fair, Weird Stone might also be a slightly different form of Warp Stone, perhaps one more or less unique to Mordheim, perhaps simply a lesser variant of Warp Stone, or perhaps something refined, transformed by the city's now rather unique aura and aesthetic. 
as there are mentions in some novels of Veardstone actually doing the things that it supposedly can, being a part of uh, miracle medicines and cure-alls, etc. It might also simply be that these are exaggerated rumours of magical and mysterious wealth, or maybe that the Warpstone can indeed do these things, but it requires very careful preparation. After all, it is the solidified matter of chaos of the warp, magic made physical, so it wouldn't surprise me if it had some uh, helpful properties. But, tragically, much like the rumours of Wordstone, many of the treasures of Mordheim turned out to be somewhat exaggerated, whereas the dangers <laughs> were, if anything, quite understated. Most warbands that enter into Mordheim do not return. Even fewer strike it rich, although there are those handful that have managed to escape from the city with bountiful wealth as well, keeping the rumours alive and healthy. Today, Mordheim is nothing more than a burnt ruin, as finally someone, more precisely Magnus the Pious, after his victorious campaign against the invading forces of Chaos in the Great War Against Chaos, turned his eyes upon the corrupted city within his own borders and gave it the fire and brimstone treatment it so richly deserved. This only happened, however, some 300 years after the impact of the comet. And over all that time, Mordheim had, um, well, been corrupted beyond the powers of men to undo, to the point that a shattered pseudo-copy of the city existed even within the war. This was used as a prison for the demon Belakor for quite some time, who obviously had his own plans for the shards and a ploy to escape them, which was eventually thwarted by the unlikely pairing of a dwarf and an empire citizen, also often referred to as Gotrek and Felix. And it is probably for the best that the city is now permanently resigned to the memory of the living. It was never a particularly nice place, really. Though I would love to see an Imperial Armour-style campaign book detailing Magnus the Pious's campaign to clear the city. Because whilst obviously he had an army, which would help, there are a lot of nasty things living in that city, and I imagine the story of how the Imperial soldiers had to deal with each and every one of them, perhaps hiring local adventurers who knew the dangers, having to fight their way through the streets and kill vast monsters, picking out objective by objective, fighting liches, vampires, skaven warbands, and worse things still, would be quite the interesting read, but <laughs> that's something that GW would have made 10, 20 years ago. Today, they're far too busy with Warhammer Plus. <laughs> Long may it burn. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.